We are emphasizing going back to school for about three lessons to close out the summer as we welcome back our college students, as we talk about our young people and our parents and teachers, everybody who's going back to school. We're thinking about that as it relates to the story, the parable of Jesus in the sower giving seed to the field. We've noticed that the wayside, we didn't spend much time with it because the wayside are people that don't even give the word a chance. They don't go to school. They don't want to be there. They're not there. So we're talking about people who actually go to school, the ones who end up having a chance. Uh, some of them are like the stony ground. These are people who have a desire, but they really don't have depth to go with it. There, there's nothing there to support the root system. We notice that what is talked about, the stony ground, I had thought it probably had reference to the kind of property on which we sit, where when you dig just one shovel full, you're in rock. But in fact, it seems like he was saying that these are rocks that have a little bit of soil on them, and seed actually falls there and germinates, but because there's nowhere to go, they're on rock, they spring up quickly, and the sun kills them. Today, we think about beware the thorny ground. The thorny ground represents distraction. Now, probably every parent, therefore every child, has been through this scenario. Because of what's going on, mom or dad says, pay attention to me. You might even say, look me in my eyes. Now, why do we do that? We do that because we want to make sure that you, th what I'm about to say is getting through. Because when your eyes go somewhere else, distraction takes your mind away from the moment. That describes children. They just get distracted. That's why they say, I've heard policemen talk about this, when a child is missing, find out if they were following a dog, following a balloon. They just end up where they didn't intend to be. But guess what? We adults, we're not immune to this either, are we? We're not immune to distractions, having our eyes take our minds away from where they need to be. We too get distracted. I saw the stat that in 2016, more than 3,400 people lost their lives in the U.S. because of distracted driving. Oh, now distraction is dangerous. Now distraction says, oh, people die because of distraction? They do. In fact, in this parable that Jesus told, these people died, this seed died because of distraction. Think with me for just a few minutes about this interesting word, distraction. The Greek word is perispao. It is a compound word that means to pull through or to pull toward. The second part of that compound word, spao, is the word from which we get our word spasm. A distraction is a spasm. Now, apparently a spasm is a stiffening of the muscle. 
Most of us probably remember those nighttime leg cramps growing up. And we called them growing pains, didn't we? That's when your, your legs just seize and they hurt and they just don't feel good. Or how many times have you dug a ditch, lifted blocks, done all kinds of things, and you're feeling fine, and then you bend down to tie your shoe and you can't get up? Spasm. Your back said, that was the straw that broke my back. You did all that other stuff, but bending to tie your shoe caused the spasm. We all know what muscle spasms feel like. Now, these distractions are spasms. They are spasms because for that moment and in that instant, they take us away from where we need to be, where we want to be, where we ought to be. It's a stiffening away from the duty at hand to give our attention and time to something else. Distractions can be dangerous. Now, these distractions might be internal, <coughs> excuse me, or external. It might be something that we see out here, or it might be something in our minds that we just can't seem to concentrate for the moment. It might be a habit that we fall into, but it also might be a total surprise. Why, I was just walking down the road and boom, I saw that. That distraction might be pleasurable. Oftentimes, the distraction of addiction is for the purpose of pleasure. There's a pleasure connected to it, but sometimes the distraction is annoying. Maybe it's something that we don't like and we don't want, but we just can't break it. And it pulls us away from the moment in which we ought to be. Spiritually speaking, the kind of distractions represented by this thorny ground seem to me to be a physical muscle stiffening that weakens a spiritual moment. A physical muscle stiffening that weakens a spiritual moment. It could happen in worship. When our minds and thoughts and bodies are to be engaged in a time of singing, but because we didn't turn off our phone, we notice somebody just sent an email. And now that physical has removed me from the spiritual. It may be that when we're in Bible study together, whether here or in a Bible class, we're there, but then all of a sudden we notice a list that we had with us that said all the things that we have to do the next day. And now those physical things, that stuff is in our minds. And for that moment, we're taken out of that spiritual environment. Perry Spato, this word literally means to be over busy about something. To be over busy about something else. To pull away from here to over there. We understand distractions. 
These distractions are not necessarily in and of themselves bad. They could be, but they may not be. As Jesus is describing this land, I find it interesting that the sowing of the seed fell in the time or the place where thorns were also going to grow. They didn't remove the thorns, they just grew together. Of course, had the thorns been removed, there wouldn't have been a problem. But because they put these things together, now we have an issue. We're not immune from distractions spiritually. I want you to think with me for just a few minutes about the distractions to our lives spiritually. And as we think about these distractions, realize we're talking about going back to school. We have a focus. We have a need. We have a desire. We have something that we need to accomplish in school Physically, you have classes to go to, you have deadlines to meet, papers to write, books to read, places to be. Spiritually speaking, we're going to school. Every day should be a time with God. Going to school with God every day to become more what He wants us to be. What kinds of things distract us? What does God say about beware of these distractions? Notice some people and what happened in their lives. I want to begin in Luke chapter 10 and verse 40. A story you know quite well. Jesus loved to go to the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and he would spend much time there, dear friends of his. On this particular occasion, he went to see them, and Mary and Martha were there. Jesus was teaching, talking about God. And the Bible says in verse 40 that Mary or that Martha was distracted by much serving. This is actually the only place where the Greek word for distraction even occurs in Scripture. She was distracted by much serving. It represents for us the general concept of which all of these others will be a part. Certainly there was nothing wrong with her saying, I want to give Jesus something to eat. I want to give Jesus something to drink. Number one, how many of you ladies would be nervous if Jesus showed up at your house? Oh, it's got to look just right. I got to have everything just right. I want to make sure that I give him just what he wants. Who could blame her? Is there anything wrong with that idea of providing something to eat or something to drink? Certainly not. But Mary chose the greater part. In that moment, she had an opportunity to go to school at the feet of Jesus. Wouldn't you enjoy having a Bible class with Jesus as the teacher? Can you even imagine that? Doesn't matter what question you ask, he'll have an answer. We wouldn't have to be concerned about whether it will apply to us because he made us and he would apply it. And there she sits. Jesus in the house we're going to talk about God. And she said, but we got to eat. I get it. You probably do too. It's a lot easier for me to study when my stomach is not growling. That's why I love the idea of studying while we eat. I don't mind that a bit. 
The eating is not the problem. She was distracted by the physical. Not that the physical is a problem, but rather she was distracted by the physical at a spiritual moment. In that moment, only in that moment, and only in that time was there a problem. You may not have another time <clears throat> to sit at the feet of Jesus in a Bible class, but you're not going to starve to death either. You can eat later. You can eat tomorrow. Right now, what about the spiritual food? You see, the problem is we can't really help it. We're physical people, and the physical distracts us from the spiritual. That's just a fact. Every one of us is dealing with that in so many different ways. Sometimes we're more successful than others, but every single time if someone asks me, why is it that this happened? Well, it's because I got distracted. The physical gets in the way. Notice some physical things that distract us. 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, <clears throat> Paul is writing to Timothy in his last letter. And there's a sadness in his voice when he says, Demas has forsaken me having loved the present world. Two other texts. Paul refers to Demas as a co-worker. Somebody who was in the ministry. But he got distracted by loving the world. Don't you love being alive? Don't you enjoy the time you have with your family? Isn't it great to accomplish something in work? Don't you enjoy recreation? Isn't it a beautiful day to sit and watch the sun? Or even the rain can be beautiful. It's wonderful. Being alive is great. But we better not let the love of the world distract us from the love of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul wrote earlier to this young man, Timothy, and he said, When I was in Macedonia, I told you to stay in Ephesus and charge them to teach no other doctrine, not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies that only cause strife. Those fables and genealogies... They were the stories and the people that were being highlighted. We can get distracted by people. We can get distracted by a great storyteller. Somebody whose words sound so good and things sound just so perfect when he or she says them. We can get distracted by the personality of the speaker. Or we can get distracted by the genealogy of the person. Oh, they have connections. They have a long history. Ooh, look how important they are. And we can get distracted. We have to beware of the distraction of people. People are the major source of distraction, are they not? Except for those piano playing cats. People are the major source of distraction. When we're worshiping together, it's people who distract us. Uh, when families are having problems, it's the people causing the distraction. Distractions of people can really cause us harm. Distractions of possessions. Again, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, Paul was warning him, those who would be rich 
Notice his statement. Those who would be rich fall into condemnation. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The point is not being rich. The point is not even money. The point is in the terminology for those who would be rich. They are so distracted by possessions that they will do whatever they can to get them. They will spend whatever effort is needed and every amount of money necessary to have them. Those who would be rich, the same intensity with which we go at those things, what if that same intensity was attached to the phrase, for those who would be God's, that is, God's people. What if we would go after that in the same way that some people Sell out for possessions. Oh, we better beware of possessions. We better beware of the distraction of our peers. Now, these are special people. These are the people that are in our lives every day. They're in our businesses, age brackets, These are the people that we put a lot of confidence in and we depend upon. Better watch out for the peers. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 15, Paul is moaning the fact. He said, as you know, all those in Asia have left me. All of the people apparently that knew Paul, worked with Paul, Friends of his, they've all left. Peers have influence. Some, because of those peers, left Paul to be with their peers. And that's a distraction. We ought to be careful that the people we surround ourselves with are not stiffening us against spiritual development. Won't that apply, college students, this semester? As your peers and you spend time together, will they distract you from the spiritual journey you need to be on? Kids going to school the same way. But finally, there is the distraction of preeminence and position. John wrote in 3 John 9, I wrote to them, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. The distraction of position that might hold power can be a distraction spiritually. Sometimes we want to be at a certain level and be respected by people in certain ways. Sometimes we want recognition and honor and praise just because the human side says, I got to have it. Diotrephes had to have it. And he had to have it to such a degree that he didn't want to have anything to do with Paul because Paul was taking some of his notoriety. The greatest servants in the world have some of the lowest positions in the world. The greatest servant, Jesus Christ, took a knee and washed the disciples' feet. Beware the distractions to our spiritual growth. I was reading about distractions and ran across 
a book entitled The World Outside of Your Head. And the whole point of the book is to discuss the concept of distractions and how they pull us away from the duty at hand. The thesis of the book is this. Here's how to deal with distractions. Work. Attention. Pay attention. Look right here in my eyes when we are in worship. Get into it. Work at it. Engage it. When you are in Bible study by yourself, get away from other things. Maybe that's why Jesus suggested go into your closet to pray. Because it'll get you away from the distractions of life. Work at it. It takes work. Keeping distractions away is tough. And yet, to be in school with God, we got to avoid the distractions. They will stiffen us physically against the spiritual advancements we need to make. Jesus says, beware the thorny ground. There's a lot out there distracting us from obeying Jesus. Not the least of which is false teaching that says... Just accept Jesus in your heart wherever you are and, and he'll come to live with and you're saved right there at that moment. That is not found in Scripture. It doesn't exist in Scripture. It is not right. It never has been right. And yet that distractive teaching is taught. The Bible teaches very clearly, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Because baptism washes away sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. Today, if that distractive teaching has kept you from obeying the gospel, why not do it today? Or maybe it's just being distracted by the world. I'm enjoying life. I don't really want to be a Christian right now. That is a dangerous distraction that could kill you eternally. Maybe if your distraction is taken you from your Christian walk and it's time to work at it and remove those distractions. Today, as we always do, if your need involves us helping you either obey Jesus or recommit, we encourage you to come as our shepherds come to the front. Meet them if you will. Let's stand and sing together. Oh.